It's going to be a classic. It's going to be a classic, classic right now. It's one of the most classic death metal, grindcore, thrash metal, noise, the innovator of the most brutal bass sounds, uh, innovator of some metal. Dude is like ridiculous. Uh, I started seeing him around shows when I w- first started going to shows, basically, like in, uh, you know, 1987, 88, 89. And uh, it was weird because I had collected his records and I, I had really was a fan of many of his bands at that point. So to see this dude is like at the same shows as me was like, whoa, cool, man. He's like, I bet you he's a cool dude, you know? All right. So this is going to be the fucking Dan Lilker interview. This is uh, was taken um, last year, but it's pretty comprehensive. So I'm going to queue it up. What's up, Death Metal Podcast watchers? Coming unorthodox tonight. We got the Dan Lilker interview. It's going to be a little choppy in the beginning. And then um, enjoy. It's going to be a classic. Smoke, I smoke hash every day. <laughs> it's all right. So, um, so basically, this is Death Metal Podcast. So, yeah, I am going to ask some Death Metal questions to you and or we'll talk some death metal stuff um like leading into death metal though i mean obviously you know you have been around the block i mean when i when i uh said i was going to call you and talk to you and you know hook up an interview with my buddy dan <laughs> i was reading that all on to your different discography let's say and mm-hmm. I was just shocked about how much stuff you really have played on and how many records you played on and of guest appearances and just. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when you look on like the metal archives and they have my name, there's like 50 links after it, you know? Yeah. yeah I mean, um, I, uh, well, first of all, there's been like the main bands I've been in that of course, all the guest stuff, you know, let's say like, autopsy doing the first you know speaking of death metal we go right to that or playing on the holy moses record in 1994 because right. i was in germany you know i just uh i love playing metal and um i'm not one of those dudes who's been in one band for 50 years like you know like scotty and or somebody like that you know i tend to gravitate toward what i want to play and if i get bored playing it i uh do something else i've always done what i wanted to do and um it's always been death metal adjacent, you know, like Brutal Truth's first record was like yeah. Death Minds and all stuff it's like, like that. It's like, for you, I noticed you had like, you know, it's like a thrash metal, you have your grindcore, you have your death metal, and you have kind of like bla- your black metal. And then even, I saw like you have some industrial and some noise too. So it's like you had like, you covered the spectrum of like, like every genre, every genre, <laughs> you know, which all is cool. cool. Anyway, yeah. I never played like modern power metal or anything like that, but uh, right. I've never played any kind of doom or stoner metal. Although you know, I do like to party just because um, I would get bored and want to start playing fast. I wouldn't have the patience to just never uh, push things up a few levels. So yeah, yeah. Um, with uh, so with back in the day when you first started getting into death metal or not even death metal say metal were you into collecting like demos and you know like the earliest because like say with your your career let's say starting with anthrax it's so early the your band is like before (laughs) death metal (laughs) you know what i mean i mean as so yeah yeah, I mean, uh, what year did that Mantis demo come out? Uh, at like 84, 83, oh. 84. Yeah, so this is around the time when uh, I had formed Nuclear Assault and was um, ending my time with Anthrax. But uh, 
Yeah, I was never, to answer your question directly, just uh, due to a laziness that's always, in, uh, that's always been part of me, I never was one of those dudes who was actively tape trading, running to the post office and throwing a bunch of flyers and envelopes and stuff like that. I was more on the musical side, so I justified it like that. Like, yeah, mm. I mean, it's easier now, but those days, you know, who's going to go to the fucking post office? And, you know, not this guy. Yeah. But I, yeah. wa I was for some oh, reason. No. I mean, no. but I was fan I was all fanned out. So, no, that's great. I mean, I'm glad there were people that weren't as lazy as me. I just, yeah. I just justified it like I was more on the musical side of stuff. So, uh, right. I got you. So, but, you, uh, yeah. But to what you were saying about timelines, um, the earliest of what you would call death metal, or you know that whole period where you had a band like Bathory and like Under the Sign of the Black Mark, or which was that there's the hands borderline, you know, I mean, autopsy, right. where his vocals were just all over the shop. It wasn't just guttural; there was all sorts of horrible gargling and stuff that Chris would do. So. Um, I think the point being that uh, that early death metal stuff was just starting to uh, manifest, you know, um, possess. Where did you hear, like, where did you hear, like, a necrophagia or an autopsy demos from? Like, was there somebody that you hung out with that maybe brought that to your attention? Or because you weren't tape trading, or would you, like, buy hypothetically from a band or something? I might have just, like, uh, Heard that stuff blasting at a gig between bands. I said, wow, who the fuck is this? And go up right. to the What is this? And he holds up Severed Survival. And I'm like, damn. And the first <laughs> thing I thought when I heard that, it was, it almost sounds like Chuck. But, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I would have just, let's see. I was friends with the New York City Mayhem guys. And before they went all hardcore, we never liked metal, that whole uh, fake phase. They were into, uh, you know, Sodom and Mayhem and stuff like that. Remember, Euronymous was uh, making a lot of chaos back then, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was just, you know, people I knew and then, you know, yeah, I remember uh, going to a CB show and Tommy Carroll from New York City Mayhem uh, managed to sneak on Sodom in between hardcore bands. So oh, I wow. And I heard In the Sign of Evil. So, holy shit, what is this? And then I went to a store in Queens and bought that. So, yeah, just uh, making friends with people, you know, they were into extreme shit. Right, and, right. Like yeah. local people, basically. Like that's where you kind of drew some of your – obviously that that guy was, you know, he, th he threw that in your, at you, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I, I was looking at uh, some old videos of the old uh, nuclear assault, and you guys were playing with, like, Carnivore – and like uh lethal aggression you know what i mean it was cool that old you know the old i mean 1986 carnivore is like right. so ridiculous you know oh yeah 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 way before uh peter got all sensitive and all that sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, he, was, he was a little sensitive on the first album when it, to get to the end of it <laughs> You know, but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Before he got too yeah. sensitive, well, yeah, he did get, get a little sensitive. Woman sensitive. I'm not going to speak ill of the dead. Yes, I of course. Also, not. unfortunately, heard that the vocalist of Trouble had just passed away from COVID. Yeah, and and that's, that's super that's unfortunate. I am going to uh, play a Trouble song on my next uh, Gimme Metal radio show. I'll explain more about that later. But, oh, cool. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna, uh, Maybe yeah, that's a big loss. I mean, yeah, trouble is amazing. Have to play the tempter, dude. Yeah, yeah, the tempter. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like the blueprint of like a doom death metal band almost. Some of the right. riffage in there. And they, what were they just doing? They were just taking old Sabbath and just kind of again, which is cool, move, moving it forward, you know, which is like that's important in music. How many, you know, black metal bands sounds exactly like Dark Throne? You know, what's the point? It's there already is Dark Throne. If you're just going to yeah. do the thing with the pinky on, pinky off, pinky on, pinky off, you know, <laughs> great fucking riff, but you can't do it forever. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed with, um, there's something else with you too that I don't know if, you know, there's like you have been in two, two innovative, like, uh, 
I would say parts to bands. You were probably like the first dude to come with a band that had like almost like blast beats. You know what I mean? Like one of the first. I mean, DRI was pretty early on, but you guys did like the Crab Society and then you did the SOD and like there was like blast beats in there. And then the other part was the bass with the distortion or whatever. I mean, so those two elements. I feel like they got co copied a lot, like down the, right down the line, you know, through all of metal. Um, sure. I mean, uh, those were such original elements at those times, like for me, you know what I mean? Because I, obviously I was grew up listening to ACDC and Iron Maiden, you know? Right. So like all of a sudden you hear like, you know, like a machine gun of a drum beat. Or, you know, this blower bass that's just like, whoa, you know, like, <laughs> not well, clean, you know? Well, again, uh, those New York City Mayhem dudes and, like, Tommy Carroll and everything, they would play me some, like, radical stuff I'd never heard, like, Siege and everything like that. Okay. Had, like, Siege Drop Dead demo was, like, 500th fucking generation, so there was such a hiss on it, it was funny. Kind of added to the whole thing. But, um, anyway, stuff like... Blast beats and distorted bass. A lot of that stuff came from like old fast hardcore. And I just kind of brought that over into metal. The Crab Society was more just like, I mean, that predated AC by a long time. I'll tell you that. I know. That's what but, I mean. That was like a noise, noise. Yeah, yeah. Way, way ahead of, damn, like way ahead of everyone. Right. Well, we just thought it was funny, you know, like when other bands had like three second songs, we said, why don't we just do a band with all of that? Why well, fuck all the long songs? And then the distorted bass, I mean, shit, dude, uh, Rainy from Discharge, man, the Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing record. I got to see Discharge for the first time ever a few years ago at Obscene Extreme in Czech Republic, man. I got such a big fucking lump in my throat. I'm like, I'm getting all fucking emo here, you know? And then I had a few beers in me, so afterwards I went to their trailer and accosted the bass player, Rainy. I said, dude, you're a big influence on me, man, fucking bass tone. The next morning over coffee, I said, I apologized if I was a little over-enthusiastic. And he was like, no, that was cool. But uh, so, yeah, um, I think what happened was I might have brought that stuff, maybe not just me, but no. this is an interview with Danny. So I'm saying I was influenced by stuff in hardcore and more extreme stuff and said this would be great to use in this metal bands I'm in. So with like SOD having milk or, you know, nuclear saw would hang the Pope, it was, uh, you know, Let's just yep. play really fast. There's no fucking rules to anything. Yeah, and, yeah. Hang the Pope. I mean, the blood is like, <laughs> you know, like it just kept getting like, you know, and then, you know, at the time, you know, and I think I told you this before, but like you were one of the first people I seen wearing like a napalm death shirt. Right. And I didn't even know what it was. And, you know, back in the day, we used to look at people's shirts to see like, who were they listening to? So if you saw, you know, Metallica wearing misfit shirts, you were like, who's that? You know? <laughs> yeah. For did. my for my age. For my age. You know sure. what I mean? Um so you were wearing like napalm death, you know, and you seemed uh, uh tapped in with like a the UK scene very early on too. Can you um, talk about that at all? Because I noticed like you have like even this right here, like this is on peace. This is on peaceville, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, I was friends with Hammy, so and then I, then there's also a lot of earache with you. You know what I mean? I see you had a big connection with a lot of the earliest earache bands. You know. Well, yeah, I think that was well. For one thing, when Nuclear Assault would tour over in the UK in the late '80s. I had already been friends with these guys just through good old snail mail back in the day. You know, I'd been exposed to Napalm Death. I knew a girl who worked at a record company, and she had gotten this promo record and brought it home and said, look at this, this looks crazy. I put it on and said, holy shit, man, is your turntable on 45? Nope. No, that's just <laughs> the same problem. experience. <laughs> right, right. I speed double. Yeah. But, um, no, I think uh, I – made friends with a lot of those people and those people wrote back very enthusiastically. It was kind of like a mutual 
appreciate society, which happened a few years later when I started writing people like Fenris and the dudes from Norway. But I'm digressing or getting ahead of myself here. So I wrote Bill Steer because he had played in Carcass and Napalm Death, and he wrote back, and he was just super fucking cool. And holy shit, man, I can't believe you're right. I mean, I love SOD and Nuclear Assault. And of course, back then, saying you loved SOD, you had to be careful because in England, they already had cancel culture that they have here now. Mm. You know, in other yeah. words, that UK hardcore scene was a little, sometimes a little too stuffy. Long. Yeah, a little judgmental and I smart. noticed. I noticed they were real stuffy. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hypocritical too, because these are people who had been into like you know repulsion and autopsy a year ago, but now it wasn't cool or that was back burner. But the point being that uh, I just made friends with a lot of those dudes because I got exposed to that music and I liked it a lot and. When I went there, I met all those dudes. They'd come backstage at our shows and uh, say, here, man, have a T-shirt. And I'd go, cool. And then wear that shirt. And next time I made a photo session or something. And that's Yeah, yeah. So it just uh, bloomed. And then maybe you heard, like, their demos or their first albums. And you were like, "This was these were fans in a way first, right? And then the next thing you know, it's like, here's my band, Carcass. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Because of those. A lot of those people, a lot of those um, people in that UK grind scene, they came from the metal scene. Look at Shane, Shane Embry, perfect example. Right. You know, dude's always been a metalhead. He doesn't like all that. I'm, I shouldn't talk about that. He doesn't like that kind of judgmental, snobby shit that went on with a lot of that stuff. You know, he's just like, fuck it. Just fucking right. play some music, you know? Yeah. So, it but, like yeah. a no nonsense, fuck it. Let's play some music guy anyway. So, yes. You know so, what I mean? But that's how, like that type, which is cool. I like I like people like that too. Yeah, you that's know? how I did. So and that's how uh, that whole thing. That's why. And then it, you ended up on earache too. You know, there's. I noticed. I'm gonna just say this first before that. I noticed you were on <laughs> what seemed like every underground death metal or trash metal label. It felt like because I have a little list here, and it was like peaceful. <sighs> Earache, Nuclear Blast, Relativity, Relapse, Megaforce. You were with the Johnny Z crew, Combat, under under one flag records. I mean, we were seeing that on our Metallica records. Right. And you were doing getting distribution with that, you know? Yeah, because I was uh, on under one flag was a division of Music for Nations, which was the uh, label that like Nuclear Assault would be on. Would be licensed to in the UK. Oh, I missed one. <laughs> I missed one. <laughs> but I, I noticed you were on so many different record labels, which is kind of, you know, it's it's not it's not completely rare, but it's just like you covered the spectrum of like all all the metal labels, you know. Well, that probably has something to do with me having played in various different bands, and then even being in one band, switching labels once or twice. So yeah, I did end up. I mean. Yeah, the music industry is the music industry, right? You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not it's a good thing I've been on eight different labels or not. But uh, the point being that, uh, yeah, I just, um, I got around. Yeah, I was I was actually thinking that it was a good thing because I was like, well, there's probably, you know, eight different royalty checks coming every three months from all eight, you know, <laughs> the 60, 65 labels. <laughs> but cool. I don't know. I don't know, you know? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that. I'm not on that part of the. You know what I mean. I'm mm -hmm. just a fan. You know. I don't. I don't know the too much about the business of metal. You know what I mean. That's probably a good but, thing. Yeah, it's it's a different perspective. So it's a little bit different perspective than somebody that's been in a band. You know what yeah. I mean. It's just. It's a unique. Exp you know. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> But uh, all right, let me see what else I got. I I, I had a really bugged out uh, thing. There was just so much. So what what about the SOD, like the the equipment and stuff, like the pedals and like what you you were using distortion on the bass, right? Yes, when we did the uh, speaking of die album, that uh, you know, at this legendary bass tone and. That is, um, I was using a lot of distortion on that, but it was not just the pedal. I was using Scott's pedal, his TC electronic distortion pedal, but I was also 
playing very, excuse me, very loud through an amp. See, it's not just the tone, it's also you gotta be pushing air. I mean, they have these speaker simulators now with, you know, with software right. that are actually pretty convincing. But uh, yeah, with SOD, same thing with nuclear assault, where we were taking stuff from the hardcore scene and we wanted to have distorted bass, it sounded rad. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Um, there wasn't one specific like pedal, like Metal Zone or whatever it was at that time? At the time, the one I had used, like I said, I borrowed Scott's TC Electronics pedal, which was a Danish company. Hmm. Um, okay. Years later, um, Tech 21, a company uh, whose pedal I use to this day, um, Tech 21 put out something called a Sans Amp. There was a Sans Amp bass pedal and a guitar pedal. I used the guitar pedal, even on the bass player. A lot of the bass players use the bass player pedal, and you get that kind of growl-ish type thing, like Craig from Sick of It All would get you, but you didn't get grinds and feedback like I wanted. So, uh, but getting back to SOD, yeah. Um, just use uh, Scott's pedal, and that's why the guitar and bass sound so, you know, tight. Real and crunchy, man. I mean, super, yeah. super crunchy, dude. Yeah, which yeah, is curious. I guess, yeah, like a combination between whatever amps you're using and obviously. Yeah, you know, was, you know was, nowadays people talk about pedals, you know, like <laughs> the Swedish sound, you know, the HM2, you know. Like, well, sure, the HM2 is all good, but if you're playing through, you know, a tiny little practice amp, you're still not going to get what you really need is, you know, pushing the air, miking it right, all that stuff like that. You know? mm. So but, what do you, you, you were, you went through a phase too, you know, which I, I have to, you know, just question you about it because you went through a phase where like you were in what, what a lot of us would consider like a thrash metal band, and then you move towards death metal and grindcore. So when you first were moving that direction, other band members around you, other people you jammed with, were they like confused and like, what the fuck is that? You know, like, well, why are you doing that? Laughing about the music, you know, because you, you just went straight past, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, that's pretty accurate, actually, as far as, um, okay, so with Nuclear Assault, uh, Anthony Bramante, the lead guitarist, and Glenn the, Evans, the drummer, those dudes were more kind of like from the hard rock scene in the first place. So when they joined Nuclear Assault, we're like, all right, we're going to play fast thrash metal influenced by hardcore. And they were like, okay, and they did a great fucking bang-up job. But those dudes weren't into, they wouldn't sit home and listen to Slayer or anything like that. So then when I start getting into, you know, Napalm Death and stuff like that, um, yeah, they uh, found it <laughs> comical, actually. Yeah. You know, and uh, the, the Napalm Death guys, you know, they'd come backstage at our shows in Birmingham, England, or something, and I remember Glenn, you know, he was cool to them, but he'd say it's a joke, and they would go, he'd look at them and go, Napalm Death! Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say it about crazy voice and they would just kind of laugh and nod and whatever and then take another beer out of our fridge but uh <laughs> here's, here's the thing dude um as thrash metal started boring me more and thrash metal in general started just kind of changing I mean, yeah yeah That's changing what I mean. and becoming more stagnant i was getting more into uh grindcore and death metal and pursuing that and then starting Brutal Truth as a project band, because Brutal Truth and Nuclear Assault coexisted for two whole years. Here's the thing. Near the end, when I did the last tour with Nuclear Assault in Europe, I had already decided, dudes, I'm leaving the bands. I was just offered this campaign for musical destruction tour that's coming up in a month. So I'm going to do these dates because I'm a professional and I'm going to honor my commitments. But after that, I'm done. And Nuclear Assault had a small run in Europe, under those circumstances. But, I mean, it wasn't awkward because they appreciated the fact that I was done with it, but I was still doing these shows and not canceling shit. But when we got to Belgium, we slid the van door open, and there were kids, and these dudes ran up to me immediately and started asking me shit about Brutal Truth and blah, blah, blah. And this was also the show where Nuclear was on it with Napalm and Obituary and some other bands, and Napalm and Obituary 
were like two or three bands higher on the bill than Nuclear Assault was. Now, don't get me wrong. I've never cared about that kind of prestige. Like, we're headlining. We're more important. But what it showed in General Roy was that our thrash metal was just starting to decline and not just be as much of a draw, while death metal and grind were on the rise. Right. And I said to those guys, like, do you see where we are in this build, dude? You know, you guys were always mocking these bands. You know, well, guess what? You know, uh, they're drawing more than we are. Do you see what I'm talking about now? And like I said, when you said they were sliding the van door open, I thought they were pushing you out to go play with Dark Angel or something. Because <laughs> I no, saw that. <laughs> yeah. no, that's another story. But uh, <laughs> no, you usually push the van door open so you could go somewhere and pee after eight hours. Yeah. But, um, no, no, that was the point where they would kind of like think Napalm Death was a joke and everything up till the time, and they still almost thought that up to the time when uh, they were um, technically drawing more people than Nuclear Assault was in 1992. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. I, went, I went to your first uh, Brutal Truth uh, show. I was yeah. there. Um, you were the singer. It was like a three-piece. Yes, before Kevin. Yep, it was before Kevin. I think Kevin was there in the crowd. I'm not sure. I could be wrong about that. My memory is a little faded, but I remember the show, and I remember you singing, too, you know? It seems like over time you sang, you played drums on the friggin' one thing I saw, <laughs> you know, like, you're I mean, a multi-instrumentalist. I'm mostly a bass player, of course, but, you know... Obviously. Backup vocals are more something that people like John Connolly or Kevin Sharp will say, like, you know, I need you to do this here, and I'll roll my eyes and go, okay. I did Brutal Truth vocals for the most part, although Scott, our drummer, did a couple of songs back in the day. Because we just started as a three-piece, but then the more we rehearsed, the faster we got, and it just became too much of an endurance test. I couldn't, mm. couldn't breathe right. You know, by then I had a nice grunt. I had a nice guttural thing going back. But... uh it, it just interesting. Huh? It was interesting at the time, you know? I was like, yeah. oh, shit. It's like Dan's doing the death metal band now, you know? But it's like, then Scott was like, you know? I was like, damn, that guy's fucking fast. <laughs> I know. For some of the nuclear assault fans, some of them were a little thrown, sure. Because they'd be like, the people who nuclear assault was like the heaviest thing they liked, and they probably were more fans of like Overkill and Megadeth. You know, Slayer and Nuclear Assault being the extreme edge of what these dudes were into. So when they heard the whole truth, they were like, what the fuck is this dude doing? Yeah, I mean, shit. Hmm. And Brutal Truth really seemed to prosper, like, over the years. I know you did something with Exit 13, but the, I, I'm assuming that was mostly like a project type thing? Or were you like a member? I or... right for years, but uh, we became bros with them, and then they had some lineup problems. Hmm. So I ended up uh, helping them out recording, you know, the Ethos, Ethos music record and the jazz one, and playing a few shows, although those were kind of drunken massacres with lots mm. of feedback and fucking vomit and everything, but sometimes you have to have that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's part of metal, isn't it? Feedback and vomit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> On the stage, you know, both. Right. Both, yeah. Feedback during vomit. Flying and, drums, you know? Yeah. Stuff like that. I apologize. There's a car alarm in the background there. It sounds like the beginning of uh oh um that Voivod song da down you know what I mean. Da -da 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 so um yeah, the thing I was shown I think if you saw a pop in the background, there was like a flyer with uh nuclear assault and like Voivod, you know, or something. And I think an executioner was on there, which I believe was the AC uh sets uh early first band or whatever yeah that probably was in the new england area then sure yeah yeah old stuff mm -hmm. so uh, for a long long time did you, you just treated brutal truth as like your main thing right in a weird way at that time period I, there was it was weird because i watched you also start to go deeper into like black metal because you were like jamming with like hemlock and you were like, it seemed like you had some kind of recording thing going on, maybe. You were recording stuff, because, uh, like, I have uh, recordings with Cattle Press, and I heard that you recorded them, you know? Well, yeah. I um, 
Well, let me answer the last part first. With the recording technology they had in the mid '90s, I had uh, got I had the standalone digital recorder board thing from Roland. I had an eight-track version, and then I upgraded and got a sixteen-track version. So I was doing some like stuff like I did pre-production for Sick of It All. Did them a favor, just came to the rehearsal place and liked all their shit up. You know, I like. Uh, excuse me. Oh, there was another one too. I'm sorry, I forgot. Defecation. Did you produce or record Defecation, or is that just that just a That's joke? Just, or yeah. what, what is that? What is that? No, Marcus from Nuclear Blast just put that on the. Thing he even put produced by nuclear assault drummer Danny Loker, like you're a fucking <laughs> genius. Um, right. I hung out for that recording because I had done a nuclear assault tour and then just stayed over to party with the Harrises, no relation. Okay. And then I'd go back and forth between Birmingham and watch those guys record, and then I'd go up to Leeds and hang out with Hammy, smoke hash, and uh, he'd be like, This is the new dark throne, what the fuck happened to these guys? and I'd be like. Holy shit, that's fucking tinny. That doesn't sound like soul side at all. No, no, that's right. That all that happened after that. But the point being, uh, uh oh God, so what did you start with? I was I was asking about defecation, but then uh, I was asking about the you got you were in a scene where like you were recording bands. You were yeah. You were in a band called Hemlock. Hemlock. Uh, so while I was doing Brutal Truth, which started in 1990, and the first phase of that ended in '98. Um, during that time, I also played in Hemlock, which went past that actually until like 2001 when we did that show with Profanatic and Black Witchery. But, um, yeah, um, when that second wave of black metal came out, I liked that stuff like Mayhem. Yeah, you seem like you were starting to get into the blacker bands, uh, you know well, what I mean? Like, it appealed to, I like the fact that there was like a kind of like a haunting melody to it and it was brutal too, you know. Mm. I kind of preferred that to some of the 90s death metal where it got super compressed sounding. You know, I'm, I'm not, not going to insult any bands. I'm just saying stylistically, that stuff was just kind of sounded like real squeezed and compressed. And uh, basically a lot of those bands were just taking grindcore beats and, you know, playing them over death metal. So that's why there was that confusing thing between death metal and grinds because then these grindcore bands, they would call themselves grindcore, but they were singing about like murdering prostitutes which grindcore bands wouldn't do right. but anyway yeah i got into more of the black metal stuff and i knew people in new york city who uh very few back then by the way who wanted to play black metal and said, sure let's do it in yeah. new york there was very few into wanting to play black metal you know in the in the united states in general there was very few wanting to play black metal i, I think I mean, there well, were some, but not all, not like Europe. Yeah, that predated all those bedroom bands. And, you know, I've had talks with, with Neil Jameson about this from Krieg. Oh, I'm sorry, Imperial. And he said, yeah, man, I, I fucking remember Hemlock. And, yeah, you guys were, like, definitely Major Mark was one of the first, you know, US, USBM, bro, you know? Mm. And, and you put out the album with uh, Metallion from Slayer Mag, right? Wasn't well, didn't he yeah, put out one of your records or something? On Head Not Founds, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the last one we came out with was on Full Moon. But yeah. Okay. I was yeah, off. Those music. are both classics. I mean, classic labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, well, I guess the good thing about having me in the band was that people knew, you know, it's a, not trying to give myself an ego trip here, but that it was going to, has a certain amount of quality, you know. You it didn't that. seem like they really pushed that angle on it, though. I mean, oh, from no. my from my perspective, I well, didn't see like not. you know featuring Dan Luther. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> you know what I mean? It was like more like real black metal, you know, like where you 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 just I don't even think you used your name on it, from what I remember. So no, my name is Balth. Um, yeah, you had to have a name. Uh, well, first of all, I've always been strongly against that whole fucking crutch thing you know with a sticker on the front of the record and i've had i've been on so many yeah. of those fucking stickers and i'm like come on dude just let the record stand or fall on its own merits you know not featuring right. this. it's like an, it's like when labels put four fans of this and that i fucking don't like that either but yeah playing black metal who the fuck were we going to impress having you know me and the band from thrash metal and grindcore bands you know judgmental black metal people there's 
probably going to talk shit. Some of them did, but those were just message board warriors. You know, was there like, was there a connection? Be, there was a connection between you and the Norwegian black metalers, so too, wasn't there? Like, I'm sure Nuclear Salt also played like Norway and stuff. And was there like just like England? Did you have like that connect with like certain like Norwegians that eventually did like black bigger black metal bands or whatever they were? Actually, I never played Norway until uh, shit, probably the Inferno Festival. I mean, uh. Nuclear Assault never played Norway back in the day, and then Brutal Truth never played Norway back in the day because of this whole stupid thing where promoters in Sweden, like metal, grindcore promoters were worried that there would be an incident or something. They, like the black oh. metal in Paris, like, I don't think playing Norway is a good idea. And then I meet all these guys later, and they were like, that's the dumbest shit ever. If you come out, we all would have come out, and it would have been fucking awesome. And, you know, you shouldn't listen to all this bullshit about how... Uh, they're you know, worried they're gonna set a bomb off at your show or something. <laughs> yeah, the bomb corpse page is gonna punch you in the face or something, you know. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. If no, I, reach, um, I don't know if they'd be able to reach you, you know. <laughs> oh, there's no reach is pretty tall, bro. Um <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> uh, they got long arms like me. Dude, when yeah. I was walking around Oslo by myself, people would come up and ask me shit in Norwegian because they thought I was a local like direction. So I'm like, I don't live here, and they're like, oh sorry. But yeah, uh yeah. Didn't With you go the, visit Varg Verkinus in jail or some shit? Oh, I never fucking wrote. I never would want to have anything to do with that guy. He's fucking, right. That's a he's rumor, cool. then. Uh, I don't know if he's back in jail, but he's fucking. He, he took out the main dude who fucking inspired everyone to start doing black. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you friends with that dude? You just wrote to him, or he wasn't well, friendly? Was, yeah. He seemed like he was against like anthrax, I have to say, back. You know, years ago, I think I he, first, you know, I don't know. I think from people who know who know him very well, I think a lot of the stuff he did was just kind of uh, trying to make a statement and trying to be a little over dramatic about stuff. I'm sure he fucking he might not have liked Anthrax when they were doing holding up skateboards, but I'm sure he liked Fistful of Metal. Yeah, I was not a touch with that guy personally, or Dade, or any of those other people. But a lot of those other old schoolers, you know, like Fenris and all those people, I'm fucking. Pretty good friends with, and uh, yeah, and they were listening uh, to your records, obviously, you know. Yeah, so I reached out to those people the same way I reached out to people like Bill from uh, Carcass and Apom Death a few years back. I just simply uh, managed to get. I don't remember how I would have got a post. I think I wrote Samoth when he was in jail. I think he was in prison. Maybe that I, was it. Maybe that was it. You know, I think I saw a post office box. I wrote Faust. I wrote all the imprisoned emperor members. There was right. a bunch of them. And they were all like, hey, dude, fucking fuck yeah, man. Love your shit. You know, and then in 97, SOD had come back and we played a festival in Germany with full force. And I arranged to have my flight home, go home a week later. And, um, you know, what up?
You guys hear me now? I don't know what happened to that interview right there. That fat motherfucker in there. Can you guys hear me in the uh, YouTube world? I don't know what happened. It uh, it happened to um, bonk out. All right, you can hear me. Cool, thanks. Let's see if we can get this going again. I'm just going to remove it. Started from scratch again. What's going on, Death Metal Podcast? What's up, Ian? What's up, everybody? That was a weird time for it to crap out while I was just right near it. So yeah, man, what's going on, everybody? I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I did this. I'm trying to experiment now to do uh, the live stream, um, like maybe like a little less. Uh, you know, I was trying to do one that was a little less like involved. You know, like I wanted to show this interview. So why don't we take this little interlude to play something cool?
Orange Bad Guy. It's a song called We Attack, We Fight, We Win.
can't see two? Two more, right? <laughs> Black Army Jack and Marauder, Usurper, Sub-Zero, and Human Battle Rockor. Fucking the families that are with us today. Fuck off ago! And fucking Chris Haas. Space Space motherfucker back there. Adam. And Adam, because he got plans. We <laughs> play! <laughs> John Pierce, of course, and Josh.
banging motherfuckers who won't trade, won't be trading shit to the scene. And also, uh, my boy Tyler, looking, looking out, Lou, all the boys, Val Ralpho, Odin, fucking everybody. Fucking Russia Bleed the Wreck for getting us to show, good looking out. And Mr. Rob Lowey, I'm not mad at you, motherfucker. Why are you always looking like that? This is a little dedication to Sodom. It's called Way of the Wolf.
activity. Don't start bands on wars. All right, don't start bands, start wars. You heard the man. That was Lino, uh, who was the singer from Headlock, he Hemlock. And you had Dan Loker on bass. So I don't know why uh, my Dan Loker interview uh, took a, uh, a dive. But I'm going to try to uh, cue it back on. Um, that wasn't live, obviously. That was uh, pre-recorded, the interview with Loker. So anyone that was in the chat trying to ask things... Um, that was uh this interview from like last year. I never showed it fully. Um, there's a lot of tidbits in there. There's a lot of cool uh, little interesting things, man. You know, bass tones and just a lot of cool stuff. So what's up, everybody? Um, on uh this uh Saturday night. Um, yeah, man, no problem, Frank Gamble. Uh, I mean, it's understandable though, because on Death Metal Podcast, like we would have an interview with Dan Loker. You know what? I'll try to hit up Dan Loker and say, What's up, Danny? Why don't you come on live? You know, because now, um, you know, it's uh been a long time. If you guys look at this interview too, like I'm like mad fat and like I'm like uh, I'm not as you know, I'm not as quick with the, the talking, I don't think, and the questions. I'm like a little awkward because. This is probably like one of my like first interviews, like amongst the first like five interviews I did with people. You know, weird seeing me in a green shirt. You don't know me then, man. Merry Easter, <laughs> crucified. So let me try to let me see if I could get this to pull back up. I remember they were talking about hemlock. It's just it's hard to cue it up to kind of put it right on point. So let's see, man. Let's see what happens here. Thank you, t-shirt. Hey, Danilo, what's going on? So we're live, but um, I'm just playing some Dan Looker tribute with a good interview about uh, the history of the Looker. Dan Looker, Dan Looker is a legend. That's right. I'm just gonna I should pin that comment. So yeah, the this is the Dan Looker episode of Death Metal Podcast. Um, I've been I had this under my hat for a long time. This interview uh, I played it on uh, YouTube live once when I went to go get uh, weed or whatever. But uh, right now, you know, I figured you know what I need to play this on YouTube, and then you know it'd be cool to have uh, you know everyone commenting and stuff. Every time I see you, you're in a black shirt. Yeah. So tonight I'm in a green shirt. I'm ready to crucify. So let me bring on the uh, the man of the hour again. This is a pre-recorded last year, but uh, you know I went down the rabbit hole with Dan Loker to uh, try to um, try to uh, ask questions maybe that no other like meddler journalist type would ask. It's going to be a classic. Back in vomit was in 1992. Dudes were more kind of like from the hard rock scene in the first place. I mean, da -na 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 -na. so um, yeah, the thing I was shown, I think if you saw a pop in the background, there was like a flyer with uh, nuclear assault and like Voivod, you know, or something. And I think an executioner was on there, which I believe was the AC uh, sets uh, early first band or whatever. Yeah, that probably was in the New England area then. Sure. Yeah, yeah, old mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for a long, long time, did you, you just treated Brutal Truth as, like, your main thing, right? In a weird way? At that time period? I, there was It was weird because I watched you also start to go deeper into, like, black metal. Because you were, like, jamming with, like, Hemlock. And you were, like, it seemed like you had some kind of recording thing going on, maybe. You were recording stuff because... Uh, like I have uh, recordings with Cattle Press, and I heard that you recorded them. You know. Well, yeah, I um. Well, let me answer the last part first. With the recording technology they had in the mid '90s, I had uh, got I had the standalone digital recorder board thing from Roland. I had an eight-track version, and then I upgraded and got a sixteen-track version. So I was doing some like stuff like. I did pre-production for Sick of It All, did them a favor, just came to the rehearsal place and I tore their shit up. You know, I like uh, Excuse me. Oh, there was another one, too. I'm sorry, I forgot. Defecation? Did you produce or record Defecation? Or is that just that just a That's joke? Just, or yeah. what, what is that? 
What is that? No, Marcus from Nuclear Blast just put that on the thing. He even put produced by Nuclear Assault drummer Danny Loker. Like, you're a fucking <laughs> genius. Um, right. I hung out for that recording because I had done a Nuclear Assault tour and then just stayed over to party with the Harrises, no relation. Okay. And then I'd go back and forth between Birmingham and watch those guys record. And then I'd go up to Leeds and hang out with Hammy, smoke hash, and uh, he'd be like, this is the new Dark Throne. What the fuck happened to these guys? And I'd be like, holy shit, that's fucking tinny. That doesn't sound like Soul Side at all. No, no, that's right. That all that happened after that. But the point being, uh, uh, oh, God, so what did you start with? I was, I was asking about defecation, but then uh, I was asking about the, you got, you were in a scene where, like, you were recording bands. You were, yeah. you were in a band called Hemlock. Hemlock. Uh, so while I was doing Brutal Truth, which... Started in 1990, and the first phase of that ended in 98. Um, during that time, I also played in Hemlock, which went past that, actually, until like 2001, when we did that show with Profanatic and Black Witchery. But um, yeah, um, when that second wave of black metal came out, I liked that stuff, like Mayhem. And yeah, Dark. you seem like you were starting to get into the blacker bands, uh, you know well, what I mean? Like. It appealed to, I like the fact that there was like a kind of like a haunting melody to it and it was brutal too. You know, mm. I kind of preferred that to some of the 90s death metal where it got super compressed sounding. You know, I'm, I'm not, not going to insult any bands. I'm just saying stylistically, that stuff was just kind of sounded like real squeezed and compressed. And uh, basically, a lot of those bands were just taken grindcore beats and you know playing them over death metal so that's why there was that confusing thing between death metal and grinds because then these grindcore bands they would call themselves grindcore but they were singing about like murdering prostitutes which grindcore bands wouldn't do right. but anyway yeah i got into more of the black metal stuff and i knew people in new york city who uh very few back then by the way who wanted to play black metal and said, sure let's do it in yeah. New York, there was very few into wanting to play black metal. You know, in the in the United States in general, there was very few wanting to play black metal. I, I think, I mean, there well, were some, but not all, not like Europe. Yeah, that predated all those bedroom bands. And you know, I've had talks with with Neil Jameson about this from Krieg. Oh, I'm sorry, Imperial, and he said, "Yeah, man, I I fucking remember Hemlock, and yeah, you guys were like definitely." Major Mark was one of the first, you know, US, USBM, bro, you know? Mm. And, and you put out the album with uh, Metallion from Slayer, Mag, right? Wasn't well, it yeah, one of your records or something? On Head Not Founds, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the last one we came out with was on Full Moon. But yeah. Okay. I was yeah, off. Those are both classics. I mean, classic labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, well, I guess the good thing about having me in the band was that people knew, you know, it's a not trying to give myself an ego trip here, but that it was going to have a certain amount of quality, you know. You it didn't seem time. like they really pushed that angle on it, though. I mean, well, from no. my from my perspective, I well, didn't see like not. you know featuring Dan Luther. <laughs> no, <I'm, laughs> you know what I mean? It was like I, more like real black metal, you know, like where you 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 just. I don't even think you used your name on it, from what I remember. So no, my name is Balth. Um, yeah, you had to have a name. Uh, well, first of all, I've always been strongly against that whole fucking crutch thing, you know, with a sticker on the front of the record. And I've had I've been on so many yeah. of those fucking stickers, and I'm like, come on, dude, just let the record stand or fall on its own merits. You know, not featuring. Right. It's like an, it's like when labels put four fans of this and that. I fucking don't like that either. But yeah, playing. Black metal, who the fuck were we going to impress having, you know, me and the band from thrash metal and grindcore bands, you know, judgmental black metal people, they're probably going to talk shit. Some of them did, but those were just message board warriors, you know. Was there, like, was there a connection? Be, there was a connection between you and the Norwegian black metalers, though, too, wasn't there? Like, I'm sure Nuclear Assault also played, like, Norway and stuff. And was there, like, just like England? Did you have, like, that connect with, like, certain like norwegians that eventually did like black bigger black metal bands or whatever they were actually i never played norway until uh shit probably the inferno festival i mean uh oh 
Nuclear Assault never played Norway back in the day, and then Brutal Truth never played Norway back in the day because of this whole stupid thing where promoters in Sweden, like metal, grindcore promoters were worried that there would be an incident or something. Like the black men mm. in Paris, like, I don't think playing Norway is a good idea. And then I meet all these guys later, and they were like, that's the dumbest shit ever. If you come out, we all would have come out, and it would have been fucking awesome. And, you know, you shouldn't listen to all this bullshit about how... Uh, they're you worried know. they're gonna set a bomb off at your show or something. <laughs> yeah, the guy with corpse page just gonna punch you in the face or something, you know? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. If no, I, reach, um, I don't know if they'd be able to reach you, you know. <laughs> no, there's no reach is pretty tall, bro. Um <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they got long arms like me. Dude, when oh, I was yeah. walking around Oslo by myself, people would come up and ask me shit in Norwegian because they thought I was a local like direction. So I'm like, I don't live here, and they're like, oh sorry. But uh yeah, yeah. Didn't With you go police? visit Varg Verkinus in jail or some shit? Oh, I never fucking wrote. I never would want to have anything to do with that guy. He's fucking, right. That's a rumor, then. Uh, I don't know if he's back in jail, but he's fucking... He, he took out the main dude who fucking inspired everyone to start doing black Yeah, 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 yeah. Were you friends with that dude? You just wrote to him, or he wasn't well, friendly? Was, yeah. He seemed like he was against, like, anthrax, I have to say, back... You know, years ago, I think he, I first, you know, I don't know. I think from people who know who know him very well, I think a lot of the stuff he did was just kind of uh, trying to make a statement and trying to be a little over dramatic about stuff. I'm sure he fucking he might not have liked anthrax when they were doing holding up skateboards, but I'm sure he liked fistful of metal. Yeah, no, I was not a touch with that guy personally, or Dade, or any of those other people. But a lot of those other old schoolers, you know, like Fenris and all those people, I'm fucking. Pretty good friends with, and uh, yeah, and they were listening uh, to your records, obviously, you know. Yeah, so I reached out to those people the same way I reached out to people like Bill from uh, Carcass and Napalm Death a few years back. I just simply uh, managed to get. I don't remember how I would have got a post. I think I wrote Sam off when he was in jail. I think he was in prison. Maybe that was, was it. Maybe that was it. You know, I think I saw so a post office written, box. I wrote Faust. I wrote all the imprisoned emperor members. There was right. a bunch of them. And they were all like, hey, dude, fucking fuck yeah, man. Love your shit. You know, and then in 97, SOD had come back and we played a festival in Germany with full force. And I arranged to have my flight home, go home a week later. And I went up to Oslo and hung out with the Mysticum dudes. And then I met all those people, fucking, you know, Mayhem Satyricon, blah, blah, blah. Mm. All the, the Elm Street in- bar scene or whatever. Yeah, um, Elm Street was this one bar. You know, I fucking met Not the Frost from Carpathian Forest who fucking smoked a hash joint with me, and that was great. And then he asked me if I wanted any amphetamines. I said, uh, Nitoc, which is no thank you. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, we sometimes encounter people that are into different uh, hobbies than we are have, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I also have encountered tons of people into all kinds of, you know, asking me for, you know, things I don't, know. <laughs> you know, wouldn't even touch in my life, you know, like coming up to me at a show and be like, hey, you know where we can get some heroin? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like uh, uh, no, I'm not, yeah, that, well, guy. Uh, I'm not that guy. They do have a song called He's Turning Blue. So uh. <laughs> it's just like, I'm not that guy. I don't know. No. So no. between after, like, say, like the Hemlock, and you know, you, you were doing that till two thousand two. You said two thousand one. We broke up Hemlock in two thousand one because after nine eleven, our drummer freaked out, wanted to go to Afghanistan and strangle Osama bin Laden with his bare hands. And okay. is that Tony? So, yes. So when he left, I'm like, well, dude, that's the rhythm section, you know. Mm. Um, basically. Uh, Ravenous was right, kind of right after that. Was that kind of some something going on in the, the background? Time. You guys were kind of talking, or uh, Ravenous was around the same time. Actually, we did a few shows and we did the some of the Blasphemy record. That was two thousand because that's around the time I met. Oh, okay. And that had just been uh, I forgot whether it was Killjoy or Chris. One of those guys had gotten reached out to me. So yeah, we're doing this band, man. And Chris always liked my bass tone. That's why I did those comeback autopsy shows in 2010. He just loves my bass tone. Because, you know, in Severed Survival, Steve is a great bass player, but it's a, it's a bit... 
but you know, when we played in Norway and I started service for a vacant coffin, it went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just spit. I got so excited. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to sound like. That's the show that Nocturnal Cold Soul from Dark Throne cried at. You made him not cry. Because, not because anybody stepped on his foot. He was just overly moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that early, uh, I guess what you consider like the second Dark Throne record, that Goat, Goat Lord or something, that reminds me a lot of Autopsy. That's like oh, really hell. Autopsy ish, you know? Yeah, because all that not, not vocally so much, but like musically, I heard it uh, without the vocals first, and I was like, "Wow, this is like a started to step away from the soul side journey and go into it like an autopsy zone kind of." And then they changed it a little bit again, but obviously they've always kept certain roots, Dark Throne through certain, you know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, soul side sounds like autopsy and entombs, and then Goat Lord. You kind of lose the entombs part, and it's You're right. Um, Bring a then little it's frost yeah. in. <laughs> we discovered fucking Bathory, and then there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, with Killjoy, and I saw uh, also uh, you were wearing a Necrophagia shirt back in like '86 or whatever it looked like. So, I mean, obviously, you were friends with Killjoy through the mail. Yes. Same deal. Yeah. Um, Nuclear Assault would play like Pittsburgh or Cleveland. I think Cleveland. He was closer to Cleveland. And, uh, yeah, he would come out. And uh, I think I had already known who he was because, oh, God, do you remember Intense Mutilation? Yeah. They were in touch with him. And, uh, oh, God, I'm trying to think. What fucking – Funny band I was in that was just making noise, but whatever. Uh, we were on the same tape with Intense Mutilation. Might have been the Craft Society. as Necrophagia, and they had the song Green Shit. So mm. when uh, Nuclear Assault played in Cleveland, so I think he just came out. Hey, dude, fucking good. You know, and then again, hey, man, here's a shirt. Cool, thanks. You know, especially mm. you're on the road. Fresh laundry. Right. Clean and, shirt uh, after a yeah, show. And, Put on a shirt, and all of a sudden, someone's like, "Yeah, man, I saw you wearing that shirt." It's like I randomly wore that broken bone shirt on the back of that SOD record, and people told me that's how I got into those guys. I'm like, "Okay, mm. cool. I'm glad to be a fucking billboard." <laughs> I mean, it's like people look at other band no, member I'm shirts all I'm the just, time, man. I know you I'm didn't, just, did you? Oh uh, yeah, I would do that. Sure. I'm just, well, I wonder what those guys were like. Sure. Yeah, you're like you were just curious to see what they sounded like, you know? Yeah, but for us, it was more back in the day where we were just looking at uh, records. You're we thumbing through metal records at the Music Box in Queens in, you know, 1983, and you see In the Sign of Evil, and you go, holy shit. Mm. That's but then click on the back, and, you know, Tom's got the short hair and the fucking corpse paint, and you're like, what is that dude about? Yeah, huh? I'd be like putting it back. <laughs> back then, I probably would have been putting it back. <laughs> But now, I mean, yeah, that it's one of the best there is. I mean, you know, right? You saw that. You saw a sentence of death, and you're like, Jesus Christ, how many fucking spikes can these guys fit? I know. Yeah, more than Curry King. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is nails. I got one of those here, but uh, mm. don't play any. Whenever any like fan ever get like stuck on it during the show. <laughs> You're just uh, like, oh shit, sorry, that's in your head. It's been a couple of drunk <laughs> accidents, but you know, you gotta watch out. Man. Those nails are sharp. Yeah. Can't have fucking so, fight. So Brutal Truth though has was going during obviously like the ravenous and all that. You know, you got was that concurrent that was going no, on? No, because Brutal Truth first was around from ninety to ninety eight and did not reform again until two thousand six. The Ravenous um, my bad. only materialized in 2000. So okay. the Ravenous was around when Hemlock was starting to wind up. Mm. And then in 2002, Nuclear Assault started doing shit again. So it's like, right. like a never-ending like uh, circular train track. And then another band comes around. and Because then by 2006, we were doing Brutal Truth again. And this is mostly because, you know, you can ask Chris Reifert about this. When your band breaks up, all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, you guys were awesome, but nobody gives a shit when you were around. He so, told me that in an interview 
like 15 or 20 years ago, I have it on cassette. And uh, he told me everyone, when he did autopsy, everyone talked about death. And then when he did abscess, everyone talked about autopsy. Yeah. So, yeah, apparently that's a thing, you know. All right, Death Metal Podcast coming uh, with pre-recorded old uh, old school interview with Dan Lilker. Since we were on a topic of ravenous, let's um let's play some ravenous, man. Check it out.
All right, the Dan Loker inter this is the Dan Loker interview episode. So back to the interview. So that was the thing. So when Brutal Truth stopped doing stuff in 98, we put out Sounds of the Animal Kingdom in 97, which was a record way ahead of its time. It took people a long time to comprehend that record. Hmm. Five years later, like 2002, fucking six, seven years later, people are like, okay, now I know what you guys are doing. And they call it shit. You guys were such an iconic, influential grindcore band. Would you ever consider doing that again? I'm like, yeah, whatever. We played in front of, you know, 200 people. We thought it was a fucking sellout. And now all of a sudden, we're fucking grindcore icons. Okay, fine. And we did some more stuff. And we made sure it was like a fucking hammer, too, because now you're talking about dudes that are in their 40s and you're playing grindcore and there's cynical people out there now on their message boards. And we're like, we're going to make sure that you realize that if we're going to do this again, we are not going to fuck around and do this half-assed. When Nuclear Assault came around, we just did that one shitty record in 2005 that I really just like, Third World Genocide, because we just rested in our roles and played our old stuff. The brutal truth, though, we were more forward-thinking. We said, we're going to come back, and we're going to make stuff that's going to fucking... That's why that Evolution Through Revolution record's like 90% blast beats. Right. Real psychotic rich hope last beats. Yeah, rich. Yeah, with the fucking with the, this thing with the hinge. <laughs> um so just to show that uh we ain't fucking around, dude. And then also in certain periods here too, you had been linking up with uh you know the basis of Napalm Death, Shane, and you guys did a bunch of bands. We uh Shane, me, and Scott, the first drummer of Brutal Truth, did Malformed Earthborn, which was more of an electronic thing because we were very influenced by stuff like Skinny Puppy and Coil. And we thought, let's do something like this. You know, and we didn't, we didn't do it with the thought like metal dudes doing an electronic record. It was just dudes who like electronic music and just getting together and getting a bunch of beers and uh, seeing what we come up with. And those were back in the analog days too. So, uh, a lot easier to do that stuff now. People could sit around their desktop. But those days, you know, we had my fucking Tascam eight track cassette board. Same right. kind of cassette. You could go buy a fucking TDK at the store. You could put that shit in there. So, uh, I got the four track version. I know it. <laughs> right. So, the point, again, the point being, uh, just having fun with him and a lot of bands. I, I noticed it was like there was even a new, like a, a project from 2020. I saw. I don't, I don't have the note right in front of me. With, with Shane? Yeah. Uh, well, I filled. I'm wearing a lockup shirt now. You were in that? Yeah, I went to that lockup show. I you were in lockup too. <laughs> I only played in lockup when uh, Napalm's manager double booked Shane. Shane would tell his manager. Don't do any shows from June 1st, June 17th, because I have shows with Lockup booked. And he would go, okay, Shane. And then a week later, we go, I booked you guys a tour in early June. And he'd be what did I? All right, Danny, can you play bass for Lockup for these shows? Oh, okay. And go, all right, sure. So I could grind. Why not? So that was gotcha, just gotcha. learning somebody else's material. Like I had to do an autopsy or whatever. You know, I just, I have a way of. I'm good at figuring out riffs. I'll say that without sounding. Yeah, good. and then and I just then, yeah joining Autopsy. I mean, you listen to them. You know, I don't know, 25 years before maybe. <laughs> you know, what was that? What was that like? You know, were, were they? I was giving, a big thing for you. Yeah, that was. Uh, they were a big thing for me. So I mean. Oh, no, I was very honored and flattered to be uh, invited to perform in their first three comeback shows. I did have, Chris called me nine months before the first show, which was Maryland Death Fest in May 2010. So he got in touch with me September 2009. Gave me plenty of fucking time and said, hey, bro, would you be interested in doing this show with us? And then it turned into also Party Son and Hole in the Sky in Germany and Norway. But first... The focus was on Maryland Death Fest, and basically it's the same thing with Chris. It's just, dude, I love your bass tone. I'd love to see how it would sound with Autopsy. I know that you wouldn't be able to join the band on a full-time basis because you live 2,000 miles away from us and got your own shit, but 
just to make the comeback special, would you, you know, would you want be interested in doing this? And I said, yeah, man, that sounds like fun. Sure, why not? This is, you know, Brutal Truth was still doing stuff, but, you know, if I tell them nine months in advance, I'm going to be playing Round Death with an autopsy, so we'll book a European tour. And then it's just a case of learning the songs. I knew some of the songs just from listening to them, but now you got to learn it right. So mm. yeah, I yeah, put yeah. the software, you put the recorded music of the bands on track one, I put my bass on track two, especially easy with Severed Survival, going back to that clean bass tone, you could definitely tell my tone. Plus, you can always cheat and do like this on the half the left side and then the bands on the other side or something to differentiate. Right. But basically, yeah, you just learn the stuff and then I would learn the songs one at a time. Then, because I had that recording set up, I would actually track the bass, do a shitty little mix down and send it to Chris. Go, look, I just learned Slaughter Day. How does this sound? We write back and go, dude, sounds like you nailed it. Keep going. And <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Having nine months to learn an hour set wasn't too bad, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm a, a question I want to ask you, too, that I, this kind of spans your whole career, too. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about this. Uh, Ravenous recorded at the same studio that Autopsy recorded the Mental Funeral or whatever. I think Snug, Snug Fit or something. Different fur studios? Oh, different fur. My bad. Um, yeah. What was your favorite and best experiences over the years? Because I noticed you had a, a large quantity of stuff recorded early days at a certain <laughs> studio. What this is, is that? The self open. Those are my scars from doing the uh, assembled and blasphemy record. You can't see them now, but that was my experience watching the guy freak out. Don't bleed on my floor. Um, during your recording. Yeah, during the recording, we were doing you know all this fucking stupid death metal ritual shit. You're doing a death okay. metal. Ritual. It's gotta be you know. First, Drink yeah. blood, you know, stab somebody. I understand. Bring a goat in there, cut him up. That's yeah. prophanatica shit. We didn't go prophanatica. <laughs> you um, didn't go prophanatica crazy? We go full on prophanatica, no. But we did, you know. Yeah, you kept out. your clothes on. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't any Bibles sitting around. Which fucking never mind. Um, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Good old Paul. Um, yeah. In all seriousness, well, yeah, I record at different. Yeah, was, yeah just uh, different studios you recorded in over the years. I mean, was there any, you ever have a favorite? Do you ever have a like a, a special thing that sticks in your head? I mean, were you there when like Metallica was recording locally or something? I don't know. Just like you seem like you were in this this little like a a circle of things happening in New York, and bands were even coming to New York to record. So, I mean, some of it would probably be there, but obviously we were just talking about Cali, but. You still got enough light here, right? We're just going to block in the yeah, sun. Yeah, we're good. The sun's getting a little fucking oppressive here. Well, that would also depend dry on the uh, time in my career. Like, there was Pyramid Sound in the mid-'80s. Right. You know, I did Fistful of Metal, Speaking of Should Die, Game Over. Then Brutal Truth did the first album, Baby Monster Studios. And I think we did two records at Baby Monster Studios. In West 14th Street, and then so there'd be different eras, you know. It wasn't like where there was always a Mara sound, or there was always a Greek Holland, or something like that. Because mm -hmm. as the technology progressed, I mean, pretty soon, you know, with Hemlock, we did the recordings ourselves, and that's why Lust for Fire sounds so fucking horrible because I got a little too hammered and uh, put the overhead mics on the drums too close to the crash cymbals. So every time uh, his eminence hit a crash symbol, it sounded like a thunderclap. And we're like, that's kind of badass. We should just roll with that. And then, uh, so we did. And then when uh, we did the guitar tones, we used four tracks with the crappiest sizzling pedal board. And yeah, we, that's up there with Transylvanian Hunger for just, yeah, like one of those really records, you know? I mean, I think that's cool, just to be honest. I like, I like stuff that's recorded on cheap equipment. I like, you know, for some reason, I'm I'm also a fan of that. I'm a fan of demos, so obviously, you know, that's the earliest stage of people playing usually. So, sure, you know, the slowest version, the slowest version of the song is usually the demo version. You know what I mean? Right. And then by the time they hit the studio, it's like it's gotten a little faster, it's got a little tighter. 
which sure. then I don't then I don't like it as much. <laughs> oh, right. I like the nuance and the subtlety of the slower demo-y stuff. I noticed that that's me as the listener over time, you know. But obviously, mm -hmm. there's people that like cleaner and faster. You know what I mean? No, I know what you mean. Or sometimes I recorded in a lot of different studios, though. Like I, I noticed the pyramid one. Obviously, was just like record after record after record. You know. Yeah, and then uh, a couple of Nuclear Assault records, two or three, were done at the Music Grinder in Hollywood with, the, with Randy Burns. Cool. So, um, sure. Well, it taught any me a favorites? lot. Any favorites? Yeah, like any favorites or things that you were like, wow, that's the best studio I've been to or the best engineer you ever messed with? Well, not in particular, man, because over the course of that career, you know, uh, recorded a lot of cool studios with good engineers, you know, really cool engineers. Um, in New York or California or stuff like that. Sorry, it's getting fucking hot here, so I'm getting uh, oh, my brain's having a brain fade. You're gonna take your shirt off like it's a show here. Go <laughs> <laughs> like this, so you won't see it if I do take it off. <laughs> now I'm just a disembodied head. So, um, no, uh. It was great recording at Pyramid back in the day because I was young and it was very educational experience. Yeah. Then, let's say Nuclear Assault, Sounds of the Animal Kingdom. I think we recorded at the Magic Shop in downtown New York. Oh, God, it's just just fond memories. That's a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of lot of different. I, I find that you know talking to people that play in bands too, they remember things that don't necessarily have to do with like their live gig or whatever because they go and they do their live gig but they remember other subtleties about you know recording or it could just be like that you went for food after the freaking show and some reason you were to remember that more than you remember a show you know oh totally man with recording if you're in a certain area this is back when you would uh fucking hit somebody's pager and they'd show up with a bag of weed or something Right. Yeah, you know? yeah, of course. You would well, write you know, some kind of little cryptic code like SOS or whatever. Yeah. Or it was my turn to go out and grab the fucking pizza from three blocks away. Mm. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, you know? it's good stuff. I mean, you, for some reason those things stick as weird, cool memories for me. So probably for you too, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, everything associated with the recording, not just real to recording but the atmosphere the environment the time it's like when uh nuclear assault do recordings to california adam the guitar player from excel worked at a pizza place a block away in fact it was called new york pizza express and where i was like we'll be the judge of that motherfucker but anyway because hollywood you know? right and we made a deal with adam because we could you bring a pie back you bring a fucking pie when you get out of work man we'll let you hear some mixes deal yeah, what would a fucking score for him? All that shit, you know, you're gonna fucking throw it out at the end of the day or not. He just fucking takes like eight different slices, throws it in the box. Now he gets to hear nuclear assault mixing handle with care or something, you know? Mm, I thought you were gonna say you let him play on the album. <laughs> no. You bring a five, <laughs> you can play a lead. <laughs> no, I didn't actually do that. <laughs> Nothing probably really got jealous. But, uh, oh. Yeah, those are fun. Those were fun days. Yeah, yeah, it's Copping cool weed. stuff, man. You know. Yeah, memories. Copping weed. What about me. um, what about uh, um, the the Dan Loker book? I I didn't ask about that. Oh, perpetual version. Yeah. Yeah, like it doesn't. I I went on Amazon to look at it, and it was like a one thousand three hundred dollars or something, and I was like, damn. That's man, kind of I it's a not going to be that much. I think that's some guy just fucking. Yeah, I understand. And seeing it's going to be. Um, just type the six of, numbers in, you know? Right. I don't know if it wouldn't be better for $666. But the book came about because a dude who had been uh, doing merch for Brutal Truth in the UK and Europe was a dude from Chicago, Dave Hofer, who was kind of like a journalist, but he'd only done stuff like, you know, punk and metal magazine articles he'd never done anything like a book and we were on tour and we were in spain on a day off in the van just fucking driving there's nothing out there but fucking cactus just like arizona or something and uh 
yeah, we had a long day just in the van, and I was just telling funny stories about back in the day, making everybody laugh. And then somebody goes, you should write a fucking book, dude. And I go, yeah, I'm not going to bother remembering all that shit in that kind of organized fashion. And Dave just sat up and said, I'll do it. And organized this thing where he flew out here to Rochester, New York, a few times every couple of months and just fucking dug into my brain. We'd go out, there's a gazebo out here. Okay. Outside, and we'd go out there, like, and depending on what day, it was, what time of day it was, it's either coffee or beer, and then you know, uh, weed. I smoked cigarettes back then, so we sit there and chain smoke. And he would just grill me about stuff, and we used a lot of stuff like memory triggers, like laminates, posters, magazines with articles about what I was doing in 1988. You know, and right between all that stuff, um, assembled a book that he. Asked me all that shit, and then when it was written, it was put more in the first person mode, like me telling you a story. And uh, yeah, it was quite flattering. Yeah, I, never, I never got my fingers on it. I, I talked to the author because I was like, I got a couple stories, <laughs> you know, but uh, I never got my fingers on it. Will they, re you think they'll remake that book or something? We've been trying, me and the author have been trying to find publishers who are willing to repress it, but it's been a bit of a struggle for one thing with the COVID shit, but also. A lot of the publishers we spoke to, I don't think they really, they're more working on kind of like a punk rock level, like they're super, super enthusiastic. But then when they realize what has to go into it, what it's going to cost, then it starts kind of flagging a little. There is, I believe, an electronic version of it. So you can at least get that for a Kindle or whatever. I think if you just Google that. I did all my research with that book, just so you know. Oh, and just from personal memory. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, but great. yeah, it was it was cool. It's cool that that that's out there. I'm I'm assuming that it goes over your memories of meeting earlier thrash bands and some. You oh know. yeah, it's everything. When I started learning to play piano when I was five, until uh, right up till we stopped. Right when I was going to start doing lockup shows, that's the last thing, the last entry in the book. I just been down to South America, so there's a picture of me standing in the Andes doing the club with a shirt on, just a shirt on, and there's snow all over the place. But it's not cold for fucking like, lived in Rochester for you know, a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cold is, uh, I, yeah. I'm in upstate New York, too. But uh, oh, okay. cool. I'm not as far as you. But, uh, yeah, I know how it is up here. It's horrible. Right. <laughs> sure, it doesn't even seem cold. With, um, so talk to me about... Uh, like what you're doing now because i i saw different things i saw blurring i saw there was uh you were on mike Patton's thing and then i saw obviously you guys did the videos through the covid with the remote videos where you guys all played uh you know you played like speak spanish or die you know which oh, I yeah. was awesome yeah. awesome yeah actually well we will kind of have to start wrapping this up unfortunately soon because uh all right Speaking of which, because I actually have my first show in 17 fucking months because of COVID coming up. So we'll start with Blurring. Blurring is a band I've played here in Rochester with since 2013. The drummer of Blurring is Eric Burke, who plays guitar in Nuclear Assault and played guitar in Brutal Truth in our comeback stuff. Yeah, so. I saw his name and he played with one of my friend's bands in like 92 or something. So it's cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Uh, like we mentioned there, uh, at the time I did this interview, uh, Dan Loker was going to play that night with his band Blurring. Um, so I don't think a lot of people have heard Blurring, or some have, I'm sure. But I figured I'd play one of their tracks. This is from 2015, though. Yeah. 
Back to the interview yeah, from um, the dude from Evoke or whatever. Yeah, he was in Lethargy so back then. But uh yeah, blurring is uh fucking psychotic grind, evil blackened grind. It sounded form. like it. It was like whew. I was like, oh blurring, the name is pretty fitting. Yeah, I mean it's not total bomb blast like brutal truth, but it's still it's uh all the chords, all the, the shit those guys do, it's uh they're not proper chords, there's something wrong going on there. So mm. uh Okay. Which is good, but yeah, and we have our first show. We're actually uh, we are playing a pig roast. Oh yeah, sick. Yeah. What's up, buddy? You want some food? Mine away. Oh, I'm gonna bring him up in a minute. I have yeah, nice black evil black cat here. He's not evil though. He's very funny. I, I um, got black cats. Yeah, yeah. and then the, what about the uh, quarantine? Whatever, that S, yeah, the quarant. That was uh, that was uh, refre refreshing for everyone. Uh, all our thrashers and death freaks yeah that was well when this covid shit was hitting and everyone's like oh my god it's lockdown you know and people were for a lot of people that was like a good kind of like little mental health thing because people were kind of freaked out everybody was freaked out you know you didn't know if you could touch the fucking banister outside your house or anything it was a very very unsettling time and i hate to sound like one of those commercials back then no, you're right it was, it was like black. zombie apocalypse that's what it felt like right everything felt like a fucking avoiva concept record and um so the idea came out that uh let's do these quarantine videos first billy wasn't interested so that's why we did mostly instrumental ones or something like chromatic death where you know there's literally three words in the song two words with three syllables i should say and then uh we thought it would be funny doing the speak spanish or die thing because scott had been playing with mr bungle scott had been playing guitar for mr bungle so oh, okay he was already in touch with Patton and said, Hey, do you want to do this? And he went, yeah, yeah, sure. And then we did the fear one with the dude from fear. That was oh, weird. that's right. I forgot about that. That was awesome. Yeah. 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 That uh, was cool. He, he's digging his claws and he won't come up. It yeah. was like, there was new, there would be like a, a drop, like every, like, you know, <laughs> it yeah. was like, yeah, yeah. right. Another. Hell no, yeah. no, no, was I think people. you might've given hope to other musicians to say like, Hey, don't like keep jamming you know what i mean like look what we just did yeah i mean i think other people were doing that too but we were probably doing it more on the heavier side than other people perhaps mm. but you want to come you up and show it. there he is oh what's that's what's hank. his name that's hank it's for hank sherman okay hank's big yeah hank's big, he's big boy. hank's going down uh yeah, we did these quarantine videos, and there was the one where uh, Patton ended up doing it because Patton is uh, half Chilean. You can't tell by his last name, but you can tell by his features. So yeah. uh, he did uh, Spanish or Die because those guys had been doing that live anyway with Bungle. So uh, okay, so that was the connection, and that's why it was easy. And then I had to, you know, we did the first quarantine video. I I, I am evolved in my production techniques to make the bass sound better first it was just out of an amp right on video and then i'm like nah i'm gonna do a proper audio bass track and then i just lip sync the bass i just pretended i was playing along afterwards because i wasn't getting a good tone unless i was like really recording so that's that's what that was and that was just yeah a fun thing and a lot of people if you look in the comments and all that shit or people i've spoken to said yeah dude that fucking really helped me out when i was freaked out man i made that's me right. Help you know, me out. Yeah, just uh, super nostalgic and, oh, look at this. And, you know, just put a smile on people's faces at a time when they uh, really needed that. And people were freaked out and they were just fucking uh, blacking out on whiskey to get away from some fucking nightmare scenario. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. All right, so we'll wind this down. Could you just throw me, like, a plug for the Death Metal it's Podcast? Metal. You know, like, huh? Yeah, it's, it's called Death Metal Podcast. And just um, you know, uh, just say whatever, whatever, and you know, check it out on YouTube or whatever you want to say. All right. Hold Here on, we... I'm gonna put you on full screen now. Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm I'm gonna remove myself for a second. There I am. You ready? I can't hear you no more. Roy. 
I'm here. I, I, oh. it's my volume goes off when I go off screen. Oh, okay. So as soon as it goes full screen, I'm just gonna do the thing. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, this is Danny Loker from every fucking band you ever heard of. That was good. And uh, you are watching the Death Metal Podcast. You are watching the Death Metal Podcast. Fuck yeah. All right, there you have it. Fucking Danny Lilker episode in the baggage. So I appreciate um, the Death Metal Podcast watchers. I've seen a lot of people tuned in tonight, which is cool. Um, pretty spare in a moment to do a Dan Lilker episode. I've had this in the chamber for a while. Um, like I said, I didn't really show it. Um, a lot of relevant stuff in there between SOD um the nuclear assault days, studios, autopsy, super brutal, man. Cool guy. Always one of the best uh, cool death metalers there is. So I figured, you know, why not, um, you know, do it. Like, he's a, uh, he's a legend. I mean, Dan Loker is a legend, man. Dan's everyone's cool uncle. Exactly. So, you know, like, I feel that, um, you know, for myself, I think I said it in the beginning, like, uh, I went to shows when I was young and saw, I had already maybe bought a nuclear salt record or something. And then I, and then I see this guy at the same shows as me, you know? And I was like, God damn, that's so dope. You know, like this guy's real, you know? So like over time, you know, it's like, it's cool to see, like, you know, what you think is a, a rock star, let's call it, for you. <laughs> uh, and then you, you go to a show and, like, they're hanging out, too, you know? You're just like, damn, man, this guy's hanging tough, you know? Please play some Tim Morris. Yeah, I got a, a long Tim Morris, so. Critical Mass. Yeah, he's one of the coolest guys. So anyway, this is the Dan Lilker. Uh, uh, I don't even remember the name of our show. Death Metal Podcast. This was the Dan Lilker edition. So we're going to be out of here. Um, I appreciate anyone that tuned in. I just wanted to run, uh, you know, the trifecta Saturday night death metal show. Uh, so we broke it up by doing the Dan Lilker one. All right, I appreciate everybody. I'll see certain people at some festivals. Um, and uh, we're out of here later. See if we got music to play out, but I don't know. I'm not